I'm actually kind of honored here. This isn't on the script, but I now actually shook the hand of someone that's been on both Fox News and CNN News. Okay? I'm kind of excited about that. Uh, May, Baron Boom, Baron Baum, Baron Baum, excuse me, <laughs> is a University of Illinois entomology professor and department head. As a world-renowned expert on insects, she chaired a National Academy of Science study on the status of pollinators in North America. Her research includes investigations of the threats to insects, pollinators, and pollinator health. And in November 2014, she was awarded the prestigious National Medal of Science in the White House Ceremony. Mike's okay, right? For the videotaping? Okay, good. All right. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming. Um, and uh, I have 15 minutes, right, starting from now. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, uh, to say that uh, interest in pollination has been growing lately borders on understatement. This is a Google Ngram Viewer. It's an app, uh, an application that lets you see how many times a particular sub subject has been referenced in a book. Uh, going all the way back to the early 19th century, and you can see we're at an all-time high now for pollinators. So there many, many pages are being written about pollinators, which made this email request from Stacey James a little bit daunting. Uh, she asked if uh, I would be the first presenter to say why pollinators are currently of such big concern, why they matter to everyone in the room, why the recent concern about the plight, examples of pollinators at risk of declining locally, uh, likely or no threats to pollinators, in 15 minutes. <laughs> so I thought maybe I would resort to, the, the, to journalism's five W's uh, to focus and make things clear and concise and finish on time. So W, who? The first W. Uh, who are the pollinators? Well, there are about 150 to 200,000 species of animals that uh, inv are involved in pollin pollination. Uh, the overwhelming majority, probably about 150 to uh, 199,000 of them um, are in the class Insecta. So, uh, not, uh, and, and there are actually many different representatives within the class Insecta. So, at least uh, in six orders of insects, there are both uh, bees and wasps involved in the order Hymenoptera, many, many species of flies, there are butterflies and moths in the order Lepidoptera, many, many species of beetles. There are even a few oddballs like uh, thrips and even a few true bugs that are pollinators. Now about one out of every 100 pollinators is a vertebrate. Uh, so just in terms of equal time, there are about 1,500 species of vertebrates involved in pollination. Uh, and they include uh, uh, sunbirds, hummingbirds, uh, honeycreepers, lorikeets, uh, and all around the world uh, there are birds that are involved in pollination. Uh, there are mammals. Bats are very important pollinators, uh, particularly in the tropics. Uh, and there are honey possums and uh, other odd marsupials here and there, and even lemurs in Madagascar are involved in pollination. And there's even a gecko or two. Um, not many, but just, again, just to be even-handed here. Uh, so that's the who. Uh, in terms of what, pollination uh, is basically uh, the, the transfer of pollen, which uh, it contains the male sperm basically, the male sex cells of plants, uh, from the anthers, where they are produced, to the female part of the plant, or the stigma. So that's the, the actual transfer of the pollen grain, is pollination. Uh, now, pollen, pollination is, if plant is lucky, followed by fertilization, which is the process by which the pollen grain grows, reaches the <coughs> ovule, or the female uh, sex cell, uh, and uh, Fertilization takes place, so the male and female sex cells merge and uh, form a, 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 a fertilized egg that can go and con continue on and become a seed. So that's basically plant reproduction. This is the birds and the bees, more bees than birds. <laughs> it's all about plant sex, and it's plant sex is important. Uh, in March part because sexual reproduction allows uh, for the production of genetic diversity. <coughs> genetic diversity is how organisms cope with variable environments. Now one reason that insects are such effective pollinators is that they are 
uh, very good at moving pollen out of one plant into another. So they're good uh, vectors for pollen uh, in uh, facilitating cross-pollination so that pollen from one individual lands on the stigma or female receptive surface of another individual, thereby allowing cross-breeding and increasing uh, genetic diversity. That's, the, that's the, the who and the what. The when, when uh, in recent years has, has uh, interest in pollination uh, picked up. Well, in 2006, there was sort of a, I guess for want of a better term, perfect storm, perfect pollinator storm. Um, in October 2006 was the first release of an 18-month study that was uh, uh, commissioned by the National Academy of Sciences, the National Research Council, the research arm of the National Academy, uh, basically to uh, charging a panel of experts, which I was very fortunate to chair, uh, to examine available data and find out if, in fact, pollinators in North America are declining, and if they are, um, who is, what are the reasons, what are the consequences, and what are the actions that can be taken to reverse or mediate, uh, or in any way stop the decline. So after 18 months of study, we released our findings, uh, two major findings. One is, we have no idea for the vast majority of pollinators. There, have, there are no baseline data. You can't detect a decline if you don't know what normal is. The other really striking um, finding is there is one species for which data are available. It's the economically most important pollinator that happens to be uh, a managed species, Apis mellifera, the western honeybee, the premier managed pollinator of agriculture. And uh, the National Agricultural <coughs> Statistics Service has been counting honey producing colonies since 1947 and uh, clearly American honeybee colonies were demonstrably in decline. So this was uh, somewhat uh, alarming uh, in terms of findings and what uh, sort of added punch to that particular uh, finding, including our, our statement that if this pattern of decline were to continue, there'd be no viable apiculture industry by 2035. <coughs> that same month with the, it was the month when the first reports of what came to be known as colony collapse disorder emerged, this mysterious phenomenon by which the foragers, the older, oldest, most experienced bees in a colony, simply disappeared, acting very unbee-like and leaving behind all their uh, grubs and food and queen. Uh, and uh, by 2007, over 20 states had reported this mysterious phenomenon by the mid midsummer that year, it was 35 states, and uh, <coughs> since that time, there have been uh, major uh, win overwintering losses of, of colonies, not all attributable to what, colony what could be called colony collapse disorder. In fact, we're still not sure what that was and if it's even still with us, but notwithstanding, uh, we started paying more attention and counting bees better, counting everybody better, and it's clear that overwintering losses are at unprecedented levels. Now, and again, uh, the results of several long-term studies started to appear after the report uh, was released, and they were also very unsettling. This uh, was from my colleague in University of Illinois, uh, Sidney Kenron, who traveled all around the country uh, collecting bumblebees. And there are clearly declines in the bumble at least four species of bumblebees are, in fact, severely in decline, probably in association with a, uh, a fungal disease and <coughs> reduced genetic diversity. If you look at the at the maps here, the gray is the historical records of the distribution of these species. Um, the yellow circles are the number of specimens collected each uh, site, and the little orange slices are how many representatives of a particular species were found there. And you notice here for Bombus aphanus and Bombus terricola, they practically no longer exist. Bombus aphanus was one of the more common species here. In, beginning of the 20th century, beginning of the 21st century, it's essentially gone. So uh, long-term records uh, started to show uh, alarming declines. Another species that has been monitored uh, for many years uh, is our state insect, Danaeus plexibus, the monarch butterfly, that leaves uh, the Midwest for Mexico every winter, that we all could spend the winter in Mexico. Um, millions of them overwinter in a very small area in Michoacan, Mexico, and it's very convenient then to monitor population sizes by looking at the percentage of forest covered by these millions of monarchs. And as you can see, there's been a 90% reduction in this time period during which uh, overwintering populations have been monitored. 
The western uh, monarchs don't overwinter in Mexico. They overwinter uh, on the coast of California, uh, near, um, well, Pacific Grove. This is Pismo Beach. And again, there's a long database. And in recent years, the numbers have declined precipitously. OK, so clearly, that's the W. When? Well, starting 2006 was uh, not a good time for pollinators. Where? This is apparently a global phenomenon. Uh, um, CCD was a really conscious raising uh, phenomenon. It led other nations to examine their pollinator resources. In many ways, they were ahead of us in monitoring uh, pollinators. And uh, data from uh, uh, in European countries from bees showed uh, comparable uh, losses uh, all around Europe and elsewhere in the world. In Britain, where people pay very close attention to uh, the, the natural world, uh, there have been long-standing records, not only of, of commercial bees, but wild bees and flies, hoverflies. They're called flower flies in England. They're very good pollinators. Charismatic, if a fly can be charismatic, then <laughs> actually look like bees. And they've been monitored, and Britain in particular has witnessed a profound uh, decline in the number of wild bees and in the, uh, in the abundance of many of the, of the flower flies or surface flies. Okay, so who, what, when, where, why? Why does anyone care? Uh, well, uh, if you like plants, then you have to worry about pollinators because at least two-thirds of them depend on um, an animal partner, well, an insect partner, uh, uh, probably an animal partner in the numbers more like three-quarters. So three-quarters of the planet's flowering plants depend on an animal partner in order to reproduce. And if the animal partners are not available, then uh, the future of, of these plants is bleak. Um, now, we happen to depend a lot on plants, uh, and uh, even the most uh, relentlessly uh, carnivorous person um, <laughs> depends no, whether he or she recognizes it or not on plants. So, uh, the economic uh, impact of pollination globally uh, has been estimated to be worth about $170 billion. And now, the vast bulk of the calories we consume are not from animal-pollinated plants. They're from wind-pollinated grains. Those are the carbs, the carbohydrates. But everything that makes food tasty and colorful uh, and flavorful, for the most part, comes from insect pollinated uh, plants. So disproportionately, insects are involved in the production of fruits, vegetables, edible oil crops, stimulant po uh, crops, you like your coffee, you have a lot of pollinator, and, and many of the nut crops. So disproportionately, even, even though uh, it's not all plants, it is a substantial portion of plants. And it's been estimated that uh, something on the order of 75% of uh, plants could benefit from uh, insect pollination. So uh, in the US, it, insect pollination is worth about $20 billion. And many of the actual uh, fruits and vegetables we eat are the direct result of pollination. Everything from <coughs> apples actually can go all the way down to zucchinis here. But there are indirect results as well. Uh, if dairy uh, and beef, cows eat alfalfa and clover, which are in insect pollinated plants. Um, uh, carrot, celery, and onion seeds are produced. We eat the roots um, or the stem, or the petioles, but, but in order to produce seeds to grow those crops, you need pollination. And some, even some crops that do not absolutely depend on pollinators, like soybeans here, or peanuts, olives, and grapes, uh, produce higher quality uh, fruit, uh, products if, in fact, they have been pollinated by insects. So I was asked, what about Illinois? Well, um, let's see, as this uh, website points out, you say Illinois, you think corn and soybeans, true, true enough. But in fact, Illinois is number one in pumpkins for canning. Illinois is number one in horseradish. Um, we're not even number one, we're number two in corn. Um, we produce all kinds of uh, specialty crops that don't get a lot of attention. So 100,000 acres of Illinois farmland devoted to specialty crops. They're worth almost $400 million. So what about these specialty crops? Well, again, disproportionately dependent on insect pollinators, particularly the honeybee. Peaches in southern Illinois, 48% um, of 
peaches are, of, are dependent on pollinators. 70% of watermelons, 90% of pumpkins. So even in Illinois, where corn is not an insect pollinated crop, um, we do have a need for uh, in, of a diversity of insect pollinators. And beyond that, for what little natural area remains, we have to uh, depend on pollinators. So there's no way to place an economic value on pollination of native plants by native pollinators. But they're here. And without them, uh, there would be a vast reduction in, in plant diversity. So there's one other, there's who, what, when, where, why, and often journalists add a letter H, how, how to help. And that's what we're here for today. So it's been almost eight years after, actually February 20, uh, 2007 was when colony collapse disorder hit the New York Times, and the reason was that uh, half of America's bees go to almond orchards in California for a two-week period to pollinate uh, the almond trees. You, no almonds if you have no pollinators. So 1.4 million colonies, and in the wake of colony collapse disorder, the almond growers were worried there would, wouldn't be enough bees to, to make almonds. And since al almonds at the time were two and a half billion dollar crops, that got headlines. <laughs> so now we are eight years later, what do we know? We know pollinator health is complicated. It has, it's a, uh, there are many, many threats to pollinator health. There are pathogens, climate, weather, bee, food supply, farmer practices, pesticides, micro, uh, uh, beekeeping practices, but the point to emphasize here is everybody has to work together. It's not just on the farmers, it's not just on the beekeepers, it's not just on the general public. Okay, um, what, and again in the wake of colony collapse disorder, uh, pesticide uh, residues were examined really for the first time in a systematic way with, with uh, refined analytical techniques, and it was jaw-dropping how contaminated beehives are. Um, but looking at what shows up, there are 121 different uh, pesticides and metabolites that have been found in, in beehives uh, with some pollen samples containing up to 39 different pesticides. But they're coming from everywhere. The two most commonly encountered compounds are uh, miticides used by beekeepers to kill varroa mites, which is a uh, deadly pest uh, of honeybees that is incredibly difficult to control. Uh, uh, very old pesticide, insecticide chemistries like chlorpyrifos, many of which are actually used by home gardeners. And then a whole array of fungicides, which are actually not supposed to be dangerous to insects, but what we now, we now know actually are. That's a whole different set. Um, so everybody should cut back if you can, and particularly you should cut down on using pesticides that aren't doing anything. Uh, and in fact, the prophylactic <coughs> of pesticides, so treating for a problem that isn't even there yet, was 60 years ago was recognized as not a good, uh, not a sustainable practice. So in uh, October of 2014, the Environmental <coughs> Protection Agency did a study of pre-treating seeds with neonicotinoids and fungicides. So uh, the vast majority of seeds that go into the ground in Champaign County and elsewhere are pre-treated with an insecticide, a neurotoxic uh, pesticide called, well, it's a neonicotinoid, and a fungicide, even if pests aren't present. And what the EPA did <coughs> is evaluate data. So the Biological and Economic Analysis Division analyzed the use of these neonic seed treatments and concluded that they provide negligible overall benefits to soybean production. Published data, in most cases, there's no difference in yield when it's pre-treated or not. Furthermore, the neonic seed treatments are only bioactive for a period within the first three weeks of planting, which doesn't even overlap with the typical activity period of most of the pests. Now, the problem with the systemics, they're, they're pre-treated, they go into the vascular system, and they're present in nectar and pollen. It's not clear how much exposure there is of any particular crop. But if it's not doing the grower any good, then there's no point in having it there in the first place. Now, um, another thing that farmers, beekeepers, and the general public can do is diversify the landscape to meet the habitat needs of pollinators. Uh, people are used to thinking that pollinators need pollen and nectar, of course. But there's more to their life than just eating. Just like there's more to <laughs> our lives than just eating. Um, they need a place to live. They need water. They need protection from their enemies. So ground nesting bees need places in the ground to put their nests. Cavity nesting bees need spaces. So, so it's diversifying the landscape to accommodate pollinators is more than just providing them 
uh, with a few meals. And speaking of those meals, it matters what they eat. Pollinator nutrition is paramount. Um, and it turns out, just this is kind of a no-brainer, but good nutrition helps bees and just about every other pollinator cope better with the other stressors. Our recent study shows that bees that are eating pollen actually deal with organophosphate pesticides much better than bees that do not eat pollen. Moreover, when bees are infected with a fungal pathogen called nosema, um, they actually survive better when they are fed a diet of multiple species of pollen, not one single pollen. So the honeybee is by nature the result of six million years of evolution. It feeds on a diversity of, of plant species. That's how it gets by. The colonies are active from early May all the way to October. There's nothing, there's no one flower that can meet their needs. They are adapted to feeding on a diverse diet. Imagine how good you would feel if you ate the same meal for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day of your adult life. Um, in fact, that diversity is needed for, uh, in order for bees to get the optimal mix of nutrients. Here at the University of Illinois, we've actually shown as well that nectar matters, honey matters. It's not just sugar water. There are phytochemicals in honey that upregulate or turn on the genes that encode enzymes in honeybees that detoxify pesticides. So if you're feeding a bee uh, sugar water or high fructose corn syrup, it doesn't get that extra boost in detoxification. Moreover, these same phytochemicals uh, also upregulate or turn on immunity genes. So a diet of sugar or high fructose corn syrup is uh, basically does not equip bees to deal with the multiple stresses that, that modern American bees are encountering. Uh, now, for a long time, beekeepers have uh, commonly uh, provided their bees with sucrose or high fructose corn syrup, and in the process may inadvertently be compromising detoxification and immunity. Why would you feed your bees sucrose or high fructose corn syrup? Because there's nothing else to eat in central Illinois. Um, early in the, uh, back in 2009, habitat loss was clearly linked to colony failure. So the higher uh, the ratio of open land to developed land, the higher the ratio of open land to developed land, the lower the mortality. The, high, the, the, the lower that ratio, the higher the probability of colony loss. If there's no food, they can't survive. In fact, um, droughts are making losses of diversity more acute. So bees, bees have been resorting to all kinds of weird foods. Here you see uh, bees eating candy canes, um, Coca-Cola. This was red honey as a result of bees raiding a maraschino cherry factory. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bees are, are mobbing hummingbird feeders. Up uh, here, this was in, in France. There was a biogas facility with an beekeepers were alarmed at the blue and green honey that their bees were making and huge piles of M&Ms were using to be used to generate biogas. Oh <laughs> now in France they wouldn't sell it. Here in the US I think they'd sell it at a premium. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then these are just plain starving. You can see uh, starving honeybees. Um, there are uh, many bees struggling to produce honey. There's not enough food. Uh, here in Champaign County, no surprise, we grow a lot of, there we are, we grow a lot of corn in Champaign County, but if you actually look at land use patterns, we don't grow much of anything else. So you can see, I don't have to tell you the color codes. I mean, yellow is corn, green is soybeans, the gray is cities. It's very hard for pollinators to make a living in a landscape like this. Um, what makes it worse, the Conservation Reserve Program, um, has basically pays farmers or pro provides financial incentives for farmers to take low-level, uh, unproductive cropland out of production and plant conservation, pollinator-friendly uh, uh, vegetation there. And we're losing our conservation reserve, reserve uh, acreage. In 2013, the total acreage enrolled 25.3 uh, million, lowest total since the program basically began. Here in Illinois, uh, this is our, we are losing 35, 31, 29, 84, 50,000 acres a year to the, of conservation reserve. Um, a lot of this is occasioned by the high, high corn prices driven by the, uh, the market for corn for, uh, for ethanol. 
Uh, and here in Illinois, some of what um, acreage, not only is CRP being lost, but soybeans right here. This is the corn belt. Soybean production is down, and corn pro uh, in order to accommodate corn production, whatever else you think about soybeans, at least they produce nectar and pollen for bees. Um, corn produces no nectar, and pollen that is not good for bees. Bees don't even like corn pollen. They'll eat it because there's nothing else, but corn is a wind-pollinated plant. The corn pollen is not <coughs> formulated, as it were, uh, to accommodate bee, uh, to make bees interested in it. So again, but it's not just growers, it's not just beekeepers, it's, it's everybody. If you think a manicured lawn is a beautiful thing, then you're clearly not a pollinator. It's basically a biological desert. Um, and particularly for using any kind of herbicide, pesticides to keep it biologically sterile. Um, so one thing everybody can do is simply plant flowers with nectar and pollen or tolerate more weeds. Weeds are basically wildflowers growing where somebody doesn't want them. There's no biological definition of a weed. And one person's weed is, in fact, another person's, um, well, Salvation Jane. There's a, a plant, there's a plant in, in Australia known as Patterson's Curse by some, Salvation Jane by others. It's a, um, it's a, a weed uh, in, invasive, but it also is an incredibly good nectar plant for bees. All right, you can also help college by helping scientists learn about them. We have a website here called Bee Spotter. Um, any citizen scientist can just upload an image of a bumblebee. We have, we're tracking populations of the 12 species of bumblebees, of bombas here in central Illinois. Um, and in fact, uh, well, so you upload digital images. There's a color, user-friendly color-guided key. We cross-reference uh, by, uh, by locality. We've inputted. Uh, historical records from the National Natural History Story, uh, Natural History Survey, and we're keeping records of these bees. And citizen scientists have made remarkable discoveries. Remember Bombus aphanus, the disappearing the bee that was thought to be extinct within a year of the launch of Bee Spotter. Uh, bee, uh, citizen scientists outside Peoria uploaded an unmistakable um, two images of Bombus aphanus from right outside Peoria. Uh, Bombus rufocinthus is another. <coughs> Bumblebee wasn't even in our database because we thought it no longer lived in Illinois, and she found it uh, in the Chicago area. So you can really help just by using your cell phone. How that? <laughs> cell phones don't kill bees; they can help bees. <laughs> <laughs> and you can support your local bee. You want to help bees locally? Help support your local beekeeper by local honey. Uh, that's a whole other lecture on how to <laughs> honey. <laughs> And, and you can learn all you can about pollinators. Tell everybody what you've learned. And thank you for coming here today. Since 2001, uh, after retiring as an ordinary minister in the Evangelical Lutheran Church, he is a member of the Central Illinois Beekeepers Association and Illinois State Beekeepers Association. His bees survive as pollinators for four local fruit and vegetable farms. Amol resides very close to the Upper Salt Fork <laughs> Creek near St. Joseph, which he talked to me about planning, planning some more pollinators. I'm excited about that. And he is excited about today's panel and a chance for public dialogue on this important topic. There you go, sir. Thank you. I'll try not to be a repetitive. Uh, uh, Professor Berenbaum. Uh, gave us a, a very good picture, um, and uh, I'll probably repeat some of the things. Uh, I'm speaking from the standpoint of uh, 
of experience and um, a, a beekeeper's uh, experience and perspective. And um, I guess from the, the, the field standpoint, uh, I come from a family of uh, beekeepers. My father uh, was a beekeeper, had an older brother who talked me into taking up uh, beekeeping as a hobby when I retired. I got hooked on the uh, I'm beekeeping, I'm still hooked, and uh, I have uh, two nephews that are beekeepers, and my son is also a beekeeper. Um, so I, I keep in touch with uh, some of my family in, in uh, Northern Illinois Park Forest, uh, bees that are within the city limits, and also uh, um, a nephew in, in Des Moines, Iowa, and uh, his bees are within the city limits. However, uh, uh, I, I speak from just personal experience, not as a master beekeeper. Uh, I kind of question uh, as far as being an expert uh, a beekeeper, but uh, I, I'm a lifetime learner, and I keep learning from other beekeepers and, and from the events such as this. Um, I have helped some be, uh, people get involved in beekeeping, and um, I find it a, a very interesting um, occupation, I guess, if you can say that, uh, to meet a lot of uh, great people in, uh, in this business. My bees are located in the, uh, definitely the, the rural areas uh, for pollination purposes of orchards, of um, fruits and vegetables. Uh, the apiaries are registered with the Illinois Department of Agriculture, and you can go online and uh, see some of them at uh, Blue Moon Farm, uh, northeast of Urbana, Prairie Fruits Farm, um, north, uh, north of um, uh, Lincoln Avenue, the Robert Kleist Farm in Douglas County, and the Copeland Farm in St. Joseph, besides uh, my own place. The uh, locations of the bees of, of my colonies are um, mostly surrounded by corn and bean fields, which is no surprise. <laughs> um, or the bean fields are, uh, corn is very close by. In the uh, 14 years that I've been a beekeeper, I've have, uh, and had bees registered, I have had only one farmer applicator notify me ahead of time that the that a, a crop was going to be sprayed near my apiary. Uh, three days notice gave me time to close up my hives um, until it was uh, uh, safe to release them and it worked and um, I appreciated the consideration yet yeah, uh, so we saved the bees on that particular occasion. Um, in 2014, I had only half as many hives of bees as I had in the previous year, 2013. Half as many. Since I have to purchase bees to replace what I lose, um, I don't know what uh, the uh, what will happen uh, during this coming year, 2015, or the, the current year. Uh, I know of uh, beekeepers who have given up in recent years or cut back, way back, and I, um, and they, these beekeepers look at me and, and when we get in conversation and they look at me as if to say, I can't believe you're still doing this. Um, but I, uh, I am up to this point. Some losses uh, have occurred in the spring, about the end of April and 1st of May, and I've lost um, a whole new colony in a, in a single day. Um, in 2013, I had to replace several queens in June. Uh, most damage seems to occur in July, just when uh, you expect a uh, uh, surplus of honey to be built up and uh, in an active working colony. And some hives, the brood disappears, uh, even though there may be a queen, and uh, bees seem disoriented and fail to uh, build up supplies of honey and pollen is no longer brought in. 
The most discouraging find this past summer was the uh, hive, which uh, had looked in uh, good, good shape one week and uh, suddenly was a problem on the uh, next inspection. Uh, I noticed bees being cleaned out of the hive, so I took the, uh, the supers apart and off of the uh, screen bottom board to find a huge pile of dead bees, dead larvae, uh, even white pupa that, was, that, that were about to be hatched. Uh, the remaining bees had, uh, had cleaned out the, the cells and uh, uh, the dead ones were, were lying at the bottom of the, of the um, bottom board. There was a remnant cluster of bees, as I indicated, uh, left in the hive and there was, uh, was a queen. Uh, I would like to have had another person uh, witness that scene or taken a video. Uh, I was actually so distraught over the scene that I uh, simply uh, dumped the contents of the board and reassembled the hive uh, in hopes that maybe the few bees left would recover. Not only are um, Apiaries affected by pesticide, uh, pesticide drift, they are affected by the actual pesticides themselves and fungicides and herbicides uh, that, are, that are applied. I have not learned the art of bee herding. <laughs> um, the bees go where they want to go. Um, I can't keep them away from bean fields. Uh, I, nor can I keep them in the vegetable fields and, and the, uh, the fruit fields. Um, and the soybean fields are probably the primary source of nectar for honey. Uh, soybean, the upside here is that the soybean blooms make good honey. Um, and the, the honey that is, is produced in this, uh, in this area is, uh, is highly desirable. Um, a couple of days after discovery of the, the awful hive that I described, uh, I received a letter from the local USDA office about uh, honeybee losses being included in the 2014 Farm Bill. <coughs> I and at least one other beekeeper in this, uh, in this county, a beekeeper that I know, showed up and, and we applied. <coughs> Uh, that application is still pending. I don't know if it's uh, going to go through or not. Uh, to me, it's uh, significant that the government is becoming aware of the plight of the pollinators and that uh, also that beekeeping is recognized as a phase of farming. Um, by the second week in August, bees are um, out of uh, foraging supplies and begin to uh, consume any honey that they, they had uh, that had been stored. At that time the bees become aggressive. Uh, we begin feeding sugar water, which I agree is not a good, the best uh, food source, but that's an emergency situation. Uh, we can almost tell by September which hives may survive the winter and which ones will not. Uh, bees are weakened, and so the whole colony uh, is weak. Uh, candy boards uh, were also added to some of the hives, which is a uh, candy board is simply hardened uh, sugar, um, and those hives uh, did not survive the winter. Uh, we need additional hab habitat for bees, as um, has already been uh, mentioned. We need early blooming flowers. Uh, tree, uh, tree blooms last only so long. Uh, <coughs> trees like linden and locust and hawthorn make good uh, light honey in the, in the honey flow. Um, and bees need late blooming flowers uh, like asters and goldenrod. Um, and they're probably some of the last blooming plants before the frost. We need clovers um, and uh, as an option to uh, toxic covered uh, soybeans. Although chemical drift will make any flowering plants toxic. 
Uh, bees at times become desperate for what they need for the colony. Uh, one late winter, I had bees scrambling at my bird feeder. Uh, the bird feeder happened to have a, a brown corn, um, and I assumed that they were, the bees were using the corn dust in place of pollen to feed the, 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 uh, the larva. And I'm wondering uh, if the uh, bees don't scan the fields being worked up for planting and uh, collect powder from corn roots uh, as an item, uh, uh, the uh, corn roots Roots are uh, designed to kill worms, and um, uh, those roots have been exposed to the surface, um, and the bees, if they carry that back into the hive uh, to feed the larva, uh, the larva are not going to last very long. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but uh, that's, that's, that's a theory. I inspected several hives on uh, this past Tuesday. The trend appears to be about 17% um, survival. <laughs> the good news is that uh, two hives look very good in spite of the cold uh, weather. Uh, we had a couple of weeks, uh, the cold weather uh, we had a couple of weeks ago. Um, the bees were fed sugar water in the fall, even though they had a good supply of, of honey stored. I added candy boards on, on Tuesday to, in an attempt to keep these particular two hives as, as strong as possible for a few more weeks. Beehives, uh, my beehives anyway, have not moved from uh, one field to another except in one case where they moved from an orchard uh, to the um, vegetable and, uh, and fruit fields. Um, the trend uh, for my rural apiaries is about 83% colony loss. I said 17% survival, 83% uh, loss. <coughs> I have a few more hives uh, to, uh, to check yet. I'm not uh, too sure about what's going to happen there. Um, so I'm, in a, I'm a farmer, I guess, in a very high-risk operation, <laughs> extremely high-risk. Uh, many beekeepers who once did well have uh, greatly reduced the number of their hives in recent years or left the business or the hobby altogether because of the losses uh, which have going, been going on for the last uh, six, seven, eight years. And it uh, seems to be getting worse rather than better. Uh, and as uh, uh, May had, had, uh, had already said, uh, uh, there's a problem, seems to be a problem all over the world. Um, the hives in urban areas uh, seem to be doing better from what I hear. Besides being pollinators, um, honeybees also produce other products that are used in pharmaceuticals, uh, health supplements. Uh, the, uh, uh, the bee bread uh, is used uh, as, a, uh, as, as a health supplement, of course, as candle making, cosmetics, um, and uh, items like uh, lip gloss, and uh, the list goes on and on. There's a high demand for local honey, uh, like we have uh, here in, in central Illinois. Uh, the problem is we don't have enough money, uh, honey to meet the demand. Um, if we could um, solve first what's uh, causing the first 75% of the problem of the honeybees, the rest of the problems, I believe, uh, for the pollinators we could handle and we could deal with. Yes, we need more uh, and a variety of food sources for pollinators. Uh, native uh, flower, flowering plants, more clovers, more cover and protection. Thank you. Thank you. We have uh, our next speaker coming up. We'll put the stage change here.
Okay, I, I know this gentleman. He, uh, him and I wander around uh, different offices on occasion. Uh, he gets that more fun than me. He gets to go out and actually work in the field with the farmer, so I'm a little jealous there. Uh, Jason Bly is a Pheasants Forever Farm Bill Wildlife Biologist who uh, graduated from Southern Illinois University in 2010. Oh, no. All right, thank you. I was hoping there was a smoky in the crowd. All right. Since then, he has interned and held positions at a number of natural resource and conservation agencies, including uh, Ford County Soil and Water Conservation District, which uh, first place I got to meet him. And he currently covers East Central Illinois for Pheasants Forever. Uh, eight counties, I think, is what you're covering, trying to cover. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, uh, and he works for, with landowners and producers to implement private lands conservation through partnerships with uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service, Farm Service Agency, and Tash, excuse me, Department of Natural Resources, and many others if he can find the partners. So, Jason. My name is Jason Bly, and I cover uh, five counties, but it's really more like eight or ten. Um, to start off, I guess this is basically what we're trying to get out here when it comes to CRP. Um, how many of you guys in here have heard of CRP previous to this? Okay, so I don't have to go into much of the history of CRP here. Um, but basically, like May was saying, um, over the last couple of years we've lost a ton of CRP just in Illinois alone. Two years ago, 84,000 acres was uh, torn out and put back to farmland. And then this last year, 50,000 acres went back into corn and bean rotation. Um, so basically, uh, Part of the reason they hired our positions in the last few years was to help farmers um, work on the quality of their habitat since quantity is kind of out of the picture. Um, we're just trying to make better habitat happen out there on the ground. So uh, like the previous speakers had talked about, pollination, 75% um, of flowering plants rely on pollinators. That is 240,000 plants. And it is essential to human health, global food webs, and all agriculture, like they've previously talked about. Um, and in the 2008 Farm Bill, and again in the 2013-14 Farm Bill, um, <laughs> the nation in general realized how important pollinating habitat was. And uh, legislation was passed to get it into CRP to, for more of the practices to uh, install the pollinator habitat. And um, mandates were put into place with the conservation programs and specifically CRP to manage this habitat for pollinators. So what is pollinator habitat? Here's a couple different pictures of some CRP. Uh, some of this is from Illinois, some is from Iowa, and some is from Nebraska. But this is basically what we want our CRP to look like, especially when we're looking at pollinators. You can see all the different species involved in it, the diversity and um, all the different shapes and forms of the pollinating species. Key considerations for pollinator habitat. Lots of diversity, which they've talked about previously. The entire growing season. So basically you're wanting pollinating habitat from late April all the way through October. So you're always wanting flowers that are going to be blooming. And Lastly, you want different flower sizes, different shapes, and different structures. So you don't just want to stick to three or four different forbs in a mix. You want as many as possible. And uh, some of our Pheasants Forever mixes have forbs ranging anywhere from 11 species up to 30 or 40 species per mix. So we're trying to help out in that fashion. Um, like I said, April through October is the most important time. And these are all different species that come up through those times. I'm sure most of you guys recognize these. And these are some of the ones that are in our actual mixes, which I have booklets in the back. <coughs> um, and not only having them bloom throughout the whole season is important, but also the size, color, and shape. So if you look at these next six pollinating species, all six of them are completely different in color, completely different in their size, and also their shape as well. And it's extremely important for the different types of bees, different types of insects and birds that use them. And more importantly here, what I'm here to talk about is the agricultural side of it. So why is pollinator habitat so important to us? And how can we uh, install it into our agriculture industry in central Illinois? 
So the top four considerations that we've kind of came up with at Pheasants Forever. Uh, reason number four, it is critically important to agriculture. Um, like May had mentioned earlier, the annual value of the honeybee population to the U.S. agriculture industry is anywhere from 14 to 18 billion dollars. So without that, we wouldn't have produce in the grocery stores. Second, or third reason, it's vital for wildlife. Um, without the <coughs> pollinating species, really no wildlife would be able to exist. And here's an example that we took from a research project out in Nebraska. Um, this is over the 10 year contract of a CRP property and these are the pheasant numbers involved with it. So you can tell over the first three to four years, the pheasant numbers just skyrocketed. And after that, there was very little management on the CRP, nothing to keep the pollinators and the legumes out there. And you can tell over the following six years, the pheasant numbers just went downhill. And that's not just the pheasant numbers, that's the insect numbers, um, the bird numbers in general, and really any wildlife that uses CRP. And here's a picture to better illustrate that. You can tell in year one, there's a little, it's hard to tell with this picture because it's so blurry, but year one, there's some foxtail, you can see some forbs in the background. Year four, it's completely full of forbs, really diverse mix. By year six, you can tell it's starting to fade out and it's starting to be just one big grass mat. And by year 12, all it is is just a big grass desert with hardly any diversity in it. So how can we fix that? Reason number two. Um, one of the other reasons we like to use the pollinating species is because there's so many different options for managing them and keeping them on the landscape. Um, and I'll go through a couple of the options right now. Um, prescribed burning. This is probably our favorite one to use at Pheasants Forever and just in general with all of our uh, different USDA offices. Um, part of the reason they hired our position was to write burn plans for people and to help people um, make more prescribed burns happen. Um, fire breaks is also another place where pollinating species can be used. It's an easy, simple place, um, and it kind of goes hand in hand with the last option of being able to just take the perimeter of an area and just kick it in clovers, alfalfa, legumes, and really any pollinator species. Some of our uh, fire break mixes have up to eight or ten different pollinating species in them, and they're extremely cheap too, and uh, very good for wildlife. And here's kind of a close-up of one of our firebreak mixes. And then lastly, um, this option kind of takes the last couple options and I'll put some together. Um, it's interseeding, which is a mid-contract management option for CRP. And uh, basically what we have guys do in the middle of their contracts is we'll have them buy basically like half of the seed mix of what they bought to establish it and we'll have them go out and either burn or do some disking or basically get all the dead material off the ground and then interseed their CRP with um, some more of the diverse mixes out there to, to keep the grasses and to keep mostly the legumes and forbs in the mix. Um, and lastly, reason number one, which is probably the most important to the farmers and the landowners in the room. Um, how to make pollinator habitat work in Illinois on Illinois farms. So basically, uh, through CRP, some of the areas that we focus on are timber lines like this, where you can see they're just not getting any sort of good yield on the top picture, and then we'll put it into a CRP field border on the bottom picture. So you're basically taking that last 30 feet up to 120 foot and uh, taking it out of production since it has low yields there anyway, and you're putting it into CRP where you can get a guaranteed payment on the acreage. Here's a couple of the other areas that we really focus on for CRP. Um, the first was that last picture of the Timberline. Um, sand hills are another good one. It's hard to produce a good crop on sand hills because they're so dry, and especially up in uh, Iroquois and Kankakee County, I deal with this quite a bit. And then uh, lastly, which you guys see here a lot in the spring and early parts of the summer, is ponded cornfields. Um, and we have wet pollinator mixes, which are perfect for these spots. Another spot is along, uh, along ditches and creeks in the county where erosion is an issue. And that, here's a picture of a uh, 
the last eight to ten arrows in a uh, timber line, you can see how much the yield changes as it gets closer to the timber and the trees are sucking the moisture away from the corn. And here's another interesting picture. This was actually from uh, Nebraska, but a farmer and uh, one of our other guys were able to work together to get the yield monitor pictures from, I think, six or eight different years. And they decided where the worst or the most marginal ground was, and they put all that into CRP. And you can tell that year after year, um, it didn't matter how much rain or how little rain, the same area always had low yields. So they decided to take that and put it into CRP. And this is a this pollinator program, which I'm sure most of you guys have heard about, is the newest, latest push for the uh, NRCS and FSA. And um, basically the way it works is they're ten-year contracts for farmers, and you have to have a cropping history four out of six years, from 2007 to 2013. There's yearly rental payments, which I'll talk a little bit about those payments <laughs> in a second. And there's a $150 per acre sign-up bonus. So within a couple weeks to a month after you sign the contract, you'll get 150 bucks per acre just as some startup money. So you really never have to take too much money out of your own pocket for this practice. And then lastly, there's also a 50% cost share for the seed mix, for the work you have to do to get to prep the ground and to actually get it planted. Um, some of the stipulations of the CP42 practice are that there are very few stipulations. It, it's one that we really like to push because there's no limitations on acreage, or not yet anyway. Um, there's no limitations on widths, no limitations on soil types. Basically anywhere that has cropping history, we can take and put it into the CRP practice. Um, one of the stipulations which pollinating people definitely like is the fact that only 25% can be grass, 75% of it has to be forbs and legumes. And uh, a lot of people think with that many forbs and legumes that our mixes are going to be really expensive, but they're actually extremely cheap. Most of our mixes range from 120 bucks to 250 bucks per acre. And then lastly, pollinator habitat equals great wildlife habitat in general. And one of the other stipulations of it is to meet that whole season bloom period, um, there has to be three species that bloom throughout each of the couple months of the blooms. So from April to June, there has to be three species blooming. June to July, another three. And then August to October, another three. And uh, we're actually trying to promote more than just three. And lastly, um, when we're working with a lot of farmers and just landowners in general, obviously uh, cost involved and payments are, are uh, definitely a necessity. You can't just go out and plant 80 acres into habitat and not expect to get a little bit of payment for it. Um, so anyway, uh, the, cost, or the uh, rental rates for the CP42 program can range anywhere from $139 an acre up to $288 per acre in Champaign County. Um, some of the surrounding counties are a little bit less, but some of the other surrounding counties are even more. So it's definitely a good option for people that are interested in uh, pollinators and especially taking out their lower yields to put in CRP. And we're going to hold on that. So can we give him a hand? <laughs> Sandy's getting ready. I do want to brag on one thing. I had to, last year, uh, I had the News Gazette call me. Um, I was just taking over for Bruce Stickers. A lot of you know him. He retired and I was filling in. He called me and uh, he was asking about CRP acres because he'd heard in the national news they're coming out, they're coming out, everybody's farming every inch they can get. And he goes, but Jonathan, I just checked the stats and Champaign County's only down two acres. So just to let you know, you got a lot of conscientious farmers and uh, to prove that, the other day we had a guy come in and he signed up 80 acres in one field to that pollinator mix. So, and uh, in Eppingham County just got an award at the state pheasants event. They signed up 800 acres in their county this year for that for that mix. So, people are out there and they're considering this. It's a good program. Are you about ready? I think so. Okay. All right. Another one of the wonderful ladies that got this all together today here, uh, Sandy Mason. Uh, she's a horticultural educator with the University of Illinois Extension. 
I imagine most of you know her, right? Yeah, okay, all right. We're, we're going to read on here. Uh, based here in the Champaign office, she uses her expertise in education the public, to educate the public through the workshops and mass media, such as a weekly gardening column in the News Gazette. Uh, Sandy oversees the Master Gardener and Master Naturalist volunteer programs in Champaign, Ford, Iroquois, and Vermilion counties. Uh, she has a special interest in gardens as habitat, and today she'll be speaking on respects to pollinators in urban. Okay, what we're going to talk about is uh, creating these pollinator-friendly gardens and landscapes. And I think one of the things that I really wanted to talk about was just the fact that maybe you don't have that 25 acres, 85 acres, 150 acres, or whatever to put into CRP. Uh, but can you do something? Absolutely you can do something. Now, if you can imagine, look at all the people in the room. Isn't this fabulous? Just look around. And we're talking about bees and butterflies and things. Who knew? We're not even giving out any money. Barely got any food. I mean, I mean this is fabulous. So if everybody in the room did a little something, how cool would that be? Just And then you go out and get your neighbor to do it. How cool would that be? Okay. So pollinator landscapes, probably the big thing I wanted people to realize with this is that just because it's a pollinator landscape or a pollinator friendly landscape does not mean you have to give up on aesthetics. You can still have a beautiful landscape, it still looks great, your neighbors aren't going to get all upset, you can still do all those same kinds of things, it's just paying a little bit more attention to the kinds of things that pollinators do. So you don't have to give up on anything, you can still do the same thing. And actually I'm going to do a little bit of a plug for a book. Uh, this is actually Rick Dark and Doug Tal Talamy and uh, May Barabam was saying that she knows Doug Talamy uh, very well. He's an ecological entomologist. Uh, but they wrote this book, The Living Landscape, and this just came out. Actually, Doug Talamy had done another book called Bringing Nature Home before this one. And the nice thing about this one, it goes into great detail about how you can have both. You can help pollinators out, you can help wildlife out, and also have a beautiful landscape. And they give you some very uh, exacting kinds of things uh, and talks about the importance of native plants and also even looks at the number of species that some of these uh, plants actually help. So we really want to look at those. So don't think you have to give up on things just because you uh, want to get into pollination. Or maybe you don't want to get into pollination. Yeah, you know. Okay, so the big thing about pollinators is that we just have to remember that they're just like us, right? They're living things. They need uh, food, water, shelter, a nice place to raise the kids. Come on. I mean, isn't that what we all need? We need those same kinds of things. And just like people, uh, when little kids, they need different things. So like bee babies. Can I say bee babies? Is that okay? Bee babies, <laughs> bee larva need something different as opposed to maybe different kind of um, areas, all kinds of different things. So we have to keep in mind that pollinators need different things at different stages. And it's not all about food, right? It's not all about food. Uh, we can't, it's just not about eating. This is actually uh, one of the native solitary bees. We often think about honeybees and some of these that are actually quite social. Um, but then, as May alluded to, there are many uh, pollinators out there that, that aren't social uh, necessarily. I don't think they're antisocial, but they're not, you know, the social like honeybees are where they have these hives. And so uh, there are important parts as well. Uh, this is something, something I think, now again, I think May mentioned this is that if you think this is the most beautiful landscape you've ever seen, then I have a long way to go with you. We need to talk later. You may need an extra course. <laughs> not just tonight. So this is one of those things, and, and realize that we have this love, we, you know, I, I just maybe shouldn't say collective we, but a, a lot Americans have a love affair with the lawn. Uh, and it certainly seems to be the default landscape, isn't it? If, you're not, if you don't know how to do anything else, or you don't do anything else for your lawn, you put it in a lawn, right? I mean, you just put it in a lawn, right? It's the default. Unfortunately, this kind of landscape, especially if you are using herbicides and you have no weeds in your lawn, uh, it really is kind of like a vending machine when it comes for when it is for pollinators and for wildlife. Sure, maybe once in a while they can get a few things, eat out of the vending machine that maybe because you have a little butterfly bush up next to your house or something like that. So you have a little something, you know, they can do eat a little bit here and there. But would you want to live at the rest stop along the interstate uh, eating food out of the vending machine? You can only go so far with that, right? So this really doesn't provide much when it comes to uh, wildlife as well as pollinators. Uh, food, and uh, certainly food is one of those important parts of this. Is uh, Pollen and nectar, as uh, May and pretty much everyone has mentioned. Uh, I'm going to just throw this out as in, you've already heard it three times already. 
what do we need when it comes to flowers? And somebody say something that we need when it comes to flowers Diversity. about flowers. Diversity. Diversity. See, you already, you've already heard it three times, so there's no, there's a quiz here. So you guys, okay. So what's another? Thing? Diversity. Concept blooming. So blooming throughout the growing season. Different shapes. Different shapes, different colors. See, you guys already know all this. This is so cool. You guys have uh, So this just kind of gives you some ideas about certainly some of the uh, flowers that might be out there for us. <laughs> Food has to be accessible. <laughs> And water has to be accessible. It may be there, it may very well be there, but you have to be able to get to it. Like with the vending machine, you have to have the change, right? And this poor kitty. Uh, I, I think he did finally get out, so that's the good thing. I'm like, you know, he didn't end up in the bed with that glass stuck on his head. Uh, but the one thing about pollinators is they're different. They're, they're different. They're uh, the, the proboscis on this skipper, silver spotted skipper on this annual blue salami. There's, there it is right there. Can you see it? That long thing there. And it actually coils back up again like a New Year's Eve favor, you know, party favor, <laughs> like that. And then they put it back out again. Well, those are different lakes. Uh, and also even for bees, and I'm sure May could talk much more about this than I can, but certainly for bees, there's long tongue bees and short tongue bees. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they have to be able to get to it. And that's the other reason why we need a diversity of flowers and flower shapes and all those kinds of things. They have to be able to get to it. We think about, certainly we think about food, nectar, pollen, mm -hmm. those things, but also life cycle. Remember? Food, water, shelter, a nice place to raise the kids. you got to have kids. And so you have to have, if you're going to have uh, moths, butterflies, you have to have these caterpillars out there, right? And so there, are, for many of these caterpillars, uh, butterflies and moths, they have very specific plants on the kinds of plants that they need out there in order to complete their life cycle. So the caterpillars have to be eating something. Spicebush swallowtail actually feeds on spicebush, which is a fabulous native plant. If you've never seen it, it's great wonderful plant to have in your landscape and also black swallowtail this would be something for like you know dill uh, uh, parsley all kinds of things now that means that they're feeding on things right is that okay with you <laughs> well it better be because <laughs> you can't have both you can't have both they got to eat something and some of it's going to be your plant but i will tell you most of the time it doesn't cause enough damage to really worry about it all that much the plants do just fine with it the nice thing is a lot of the flowers, the plants and stuff that we talk about are multi-use plants. Yay! Native butterfly weed is a great plant. It's a native plant. The nice thing is, certainly I think a lot of you know, that it is, it is one of those milk weeds that monarchs have to have in order to lay their eggs. And then that's one of the monarch caterpillars right there, kind of hanging out. And the nice thing is it also provides nectar and pollen. You can see a lot of the other pollinators, uh, bees, bumblebees, and stuff, will also use milkweed. So it doesn't necessarily mean it's only for one use. So that's great. We love having those out there. Uh, what we generally would want to go for is we'd opt for native plants. That'd be our first choice. Because we're talking about that diversity that's out there, um, and it really is one of those things that we would really like to see is to opt for those native plants. I'm a horticulturalist, as well as a naturalist, as well as a whole bunch of other names you could probably call me that maybe you don't want to. But, uh, <laughs> other names. but the one thing is, I will tell you, is that some of the native plants, where are they? They're out there in that CRP land, and they have all their neighbors, they have grasses and everything else, to hold them up. Now, what do they do when you put them out in your landscape? They, follow they flop over. Well, of course they're going to flop over. They don't have their buddy that was holding them up out in the prairie area. So I will tell you that sometimes native plants, they are ones that might flop over a little bit. What we've tried to do is actually uh, pick some that aren't going to do that. So there, I will tell you there are plenty of native plants that don't necessarily do that. So if you tried a native plant, flopped over, you weren't all that terribly happy about it, uh, believe me, there are plenty of uh, other ones out there that you can, you can really deal with and have a good, uh, good experience with those. So we know that native plants support a wider diversity of pollinators. We know that part of it. And they support different stages of the life cycle of pollinators. So we know those things too. So that's an important part. And there's one of those hoverflies that um, May was talking about, and that's on white snake root. It's a native plant. Goldenrod is a great one, and I think several people mentioned it. Even mentioned that goldenrod. And actually, in the living landscape, that's one of the first plants or first species of plants that he talks about as in supporting like 155 different lepidopteran species. Fabulous, fabulous plant. Goldenrods. Who thinks goldenrods cause hay fever? No. 
Oh, good. Yay! Maybe we finally just spelled that yeah. They don't cause hay fever. They're insect pollinated, so they don't cause hay fever. It's not out there blowing around. It's ragweed that's blooming at the same time that's causing that. So lots of native uh, goldenrods that are out there. The nice thing is, if you think goldenrod has to be this giant plant, you can only put it in the sun. Believe me, there's some native ones that actually do quite well in shady environments as well, and it's much shorter than that. So there's plenty of those out there, and even some cultivars as well. So that's good. Uh, asters are another great group. We love it. Remember we were talking about kind of that late season. Emo was talking about that kind of late season, August, September. We started having problems with not having enough forage for them. Goldenrods, asters, those are the type of plants that are going to be blooming during that time to, to provide that extra forage. And there are many, many, many asters out there that really will do quite well for you. Lots of bright iridescent colors that I just love. Uh, bee bomb is another great one. Bee bomb, what a great name. Who knew? You know, bee bomb. Uh, the nice thing about this one, there are some native, there is a native one, this uh, Menarda fistulosa is a native one. There are some non-native ones as well that I say will, are also quite good. So you don't necessarily have to use strictly native plants, at least in my mind. The nice thing about the non-native ones, I will tell you, is that they've made selections for powdery mildew <coughs> resistance, which is one of the big problems with uh, even the native Menarda bee bomb. So that's, to me, that's a great great compromise, I guess, is to go ahead and those, have those powdery mildew resistant bee bombs. Does it mean that non-native stuff is bad? Butterfly bush. It must be a good plant, right? It must be great, right? Sure. This is non-native. This is Budley. This is a non-native plant. <laughs> Absolutely. Butterflies will use it. You'll see all kinds of pollinators on these. The problem with these kind of non-native plants is there is nothing that uses this to complete its life cycle. In other words, it doesn't lay its eggs on it. It doesn't go ahead and feed on it. It doesn't continue the life cycle. So we're back to the vending machine. You can come, get a little meal, move on. So it doesn't necessarily mean they're horrible. It's just I wouldn't want to fill your whole landscape with these expecting that you're going to have this great pollinator garden. Sedums are another non-native that I would say also is just a great, they're great plant. Uh, they're very, especially if you want something maybe it's a little bit more kempt uh, and doesn't flop over. I think the nice thing about these sedums is the fact that they're, they're again, blooming that late <coughs> season. There are many cultivars, and they're very well-behaved type of plants that uh, these non-natives, I think, are great. Great for uh, really full sun, drought, they're wonderful. Uh, I would also put catnip in this. This is in the mint family, and you'll find a lot of the pollinators like plants in the mint family. If you're worried about all the cats are going to be rolling around in your yard uh, because you have your cat mint, this is not cat nip, this is cat mint, which is different. And it has kind of a mini fragrance to it, but it is another great plant. It will absolutely, it blooms very early in the season in May. If you shear it, it will bloom through the rest, pretty much the rest of the season. You will have a plant that will pretty much bloom all season long. So I think they're great plants. <coughs> When it comes to cultivars, as a cultivated variety, it's what cultivated are, variety cultivars are. There's a lot of question, and I don't know, some people will say don't use cultivars. I, I think we got to go with what our heart tells us, uh, but if you are going to go with cultivars, what I would look for is like in the zinnia, these are two different types of zinnias, I would go with ones that are more daisy like, this, what are called single petals. When we start getting these multiple petals, then we start having issues, and there's a, uh, then would be quite uh, a, quite a bit of concern about whether the pollinators would be able to use these. So if you're going with cultivars, I would try to get ones that look, you know, along those same lines of more daisy types. A variety of flowers. We already talked about this. The colors, shapes. These are all native plants, which add a lot, so much to our landscapes. Flowers throughout the season. Don't forget. You know, just we have golden alexanders, which I think is a great early season plant. But don't forget the trees and shrubs out there. You know, crab apples. You know, the bees absolutely love them. Uh, native plums, lots of those out there, and certainly lots of shrubs that will also do great for pollinators. Masses of flowers, so they don't have to travel quite so far. When I have those in the air. One of the things that the master gardeners and master naturalists came up with here in our area is this idea of pollinator pocket because we knew. People would be going, okay, now what am I supposed to do? Now what do I do? I got all these decisions to make. So we decided, okay, let's just come up with some basic ideas, some basic designs that you can go ahead and just do. And imagine if everybody in this room did these pollinator pockets, we, what an amazing thing it would be. And so what we tried to do is small, manageable designs, four by six foot, 
ones that are perennial plants, easy care, availability, those kinds of things, so you don't have to worry too much about that. And then we're going to continue with our designs as time goes on. These are actually on our website, and you can find uh, these. This is that one of the native woodland plant ones. We try to give some options if people don't find those particular plants. So it's just real basic, these cookie cutter things uh, to really help you. We made some designs to make sure that things are blooming throughout the season. Try to keep all those things in mind as far as the shapes and the colors and all those kinds of things. And still have a beautiful garden. How cool. Overall designs, I would definitely think of think in layers. So as you think about ground covers, herbaceous plants, shrubs, small trees, big trees, that's really what we're talking about, where it looks more like if you went out in the woods, what would it look like? All those different layers, of the kinds of things that we're looking for. And I, and I see, at least, where we're going to see these, uh, where it's really a mix of natives as well as what I'll say well-behaved non-natives, so ones that we know are not going to be an issue when it comes to invasives. So I, I think there's nothing wrong with, with doing both of those things together, at least in my mind. Eliminate pesticide use. We, we've talked about that or certainly reduce it. And realize that you're going to have these kind of issues. This is actually leaf cutter bee damage on uh, hostas. Um, I think it's kind of cool. <laughs> I think it's cool. Uh, now, if you were a hosta grower, you'd probably think this is like, oh my gosh, something's eating my plant. But can, if you can look at this, I mean, look, the majority of the plant is just fine. The leaf is just fine. You know, it's got a little extra fringe on it. So I think it's just got a little extra fringe. You know, whatever. It looks like a designer thing. It looks like a designer thing. That's what we should call it. It's a designer hosta. Yes, yeah. scalloped. Scalloped edges. Scalloped edges. And accessible water is a big deal, too, of course. You've got to make sure that, especially when we have these drought periods and stuff, honeybees will certainly use, sometimes to owners um, uh, not so happy, that have pools. They may not be all like, terribly crazy about it, but they need water out there. So maybe decide that you're going to have some areas where the bees, the butterflies and stuff, can actually use these. Maybe put out a shallow bird bath filled with soil, but then keep it moist. Uh, have a rocky area that you keep moist, those kinds of things, so that they have uh, water accessible to them. Leaving stems over the winter time. I think it looks kind of nice anyway, so if you're one of those piece, people that really feels like you need to clean up everything in the fall, maybe certain areas, you leave some of the stuff off. It's really important for shelter as well as uh, nesting for some of the, ant, for the, some of the pollinators. And I know this is for some folks, but I'm assuming since you're already here that maybe you're not have a terribly wonderful love affair with your lawn. But just to realize dandelions, look how early they flower. Uh, for a lot of the pollinators, I would say, Emo, maybe you know this as well as me, is that for a lot of the pollinators, dandelions are like it, right? Is this probably pretty good pollen, even though they're not native? Yeah, probably pretty good pollen. So dandelions, if you let the dandelions, white clover, I don't know how many times I've seen uh, honeybees on white clover that's in a lawn. Uh, even violets. So think about it now. Maybe you can't do it in your front yard because you just don't feel like the neighbors are going to like you anymore and you're going <laughs> to create all kinds of havoc. Do it in the backyard. Do it in a side yard. Do it someplace where maybe people don't see it, but just have one area maybe where you can go ahead and let some of these things happen. Uh, certainly providing some of these nesting areas, uh, there are things called bee boxes, uh, but I would also say for some of the ground nesting bees, what I have found along flagstone pathways where we've kind of used a lot of sand or maybe even gravel and stuff along flagstone pathways, a lot of the ground nesters like those, the bees like those areas because it's open, So, or maybe just have some unmulched areas, those kinds of things. And personally, I haven't had a problem with having them near a pathway, but you know, it's one of those things, you kind of have to maybe put it in off in a certain area so you don't have to worry about um, and them, because they really don't want to go for you. I mean, they have much better things to do than worry about you, so, <laughs> so don't worry about them. Okay, so hopefully this is a bit of a primer as I've talked really, really, really fast, and I think I got under my time, uh, and I think now we have time for questions. Well, first, can we give her a round okay, of applause? Good. Okay, we're going to move into our questions because as I see a few people sneaking out, can I ask one huge favor? Uh, when you sat down, and I don't know if they passed it out for those of you standing, but there should be an evaluation form. Could you please fill that out and turn it into us? Because we would really like, uh, we've been talking, we'd really like to maybe do this again, but hit other topics. So with that, we have a microphone for, a couple microphones for our panels. Uh, do we have anybody who would like right here? We'll have our first question. Bees 
carry pollen on their legs in those pollen pants. Where do the flies carry the pollen? They actually don't uh, carry it per se as much as they get, uh, it just falls on them and it's uh, less, uh, less precise of a process. Uh, that said, the surface, the hoverflies, are really good pollinators. Blowflies, the uh, maggots that eat dead things, the adult stages are amazingly good pollinators, among other things like carrots and, and onions and the like. Uh, anybody who has any kind of hair can carry pollen. Bees are really good because their hair is branched, and it's a little bit electrostatically charged, so the pollen almost jumps on it. But, but flies do all right. Carry flies are fine. <laughs> yes, um, I'd like to address the to those uh, who might be interested. Uh, do, do the bee colonies are they affected by climate change? Has any of the climate change that we have, or the uh, air, or the, the, the lack of clean air for them, uh, could they have caused some of the uh, deterioration in bee colonies? Uh, some, some bees have uh, survived some of the coldest weather. Um, and um, uh, the, um, we, we can't raise enough bees in this area uh, to, to um, fill the need. Most of the bees that we purchase come out of the south. And um, that's where a lot of the uh, pollination takes place for the uh, food orchards like the orange groves and so on in uh, Florida and Texas. And um, uh, because they don't use the, as many uh, uh, pesticides and so on at that time of pollination, the bee colonies uh, actually expand and they, uh, those beekeepers are finding places for, uh, for the extra bees. So they're uh, packaged up and uh, we have in the north uh, purchase them. Uh, I'm not sure that uh, beyond that, that the climate change has a great effect. But the, the, big, the biggest thing that I have experienced is that if the bees have sufficient stores of good honey and there is a large number of bees in the hive, that they will survive the winter. And uh, uh, but the, like I can quite indicate the uh, where the hives do not have uh, enough bees in them and they don't have any uh, much store of honey, they're not going to survive. One of, one of the hallmarks of climate change is uh, 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 increasing variability of climate, including the increased frequency of droughts, and droughts have an enormous uh, impact on pollinators. Moreover, increasing warming beyond bees changes the phenology or the seasonality of different species. So uh, what has, has seems to have happened, among other things, bumblebees, for example, are kind of locked into their winter coast. They need cold weather. And all around the world, bumblebee ranges are changing. They're shifting northward or they're moving up mountains. So they're at an altitudinally changing. Um, some of them are just dropping out altogether. There's also mismatches. There are very few, a handful of plant species that depend on particular insect pollinators. And if they, if their ranges are changing at different rates, if they're responding to climate change at different rates, then you get mismatches and you, you find plant populations without pollinators. So there are all kinds of effects um, of the various manifestations of climate change. Um, I've been reading, uh, doing some research, because uh, I actually applied for a small grant to um, put more um, pollinator species on our farm, and one of the studies that I found that, uh, that was done at Michigan State was actually um, saying that uh, uh, planting areas of single species plants uh, that are blooming in succession is actually a better way to attract and keep um, pollinators than having um, a spatial diversity. And I was wondering, um, since that flies in the face of what so many of you are recommending, um, 
uh, what, what, if you've heard of that work and, and what you think of it. So for example, planting single stands of brassicas for spring, for spring uh, pollination, going into um, mid-season buckwheat or clover stands, and following with some kind of fall flowering species, but focusing on either single or dual species sw uh, swaths of plants. <laughs> I think it would depend uh, to a great extent on the nature of the pollinator community um, as to whether, uh, I mean, it, diversity has all, all kinds of dimensions, so um, as long as, as there are sufficient uh, resources for the pollinator community, um, I still think there are so, well, <coughs> If you have a stock portfolio, you never invest in one thing at one time. I mean, even so, even if there is a marginal benefit, I think long term, that's not necessarily an optimal strategy. Do you remember, was this uh, Rufus Isaacs who did that work? Do you know? Like that? Was it uh, Ruf Ruf Rufus Isaacs? Was that the name of the individual who did uh, that? It work? was, I think one of his graduate students did that. Yeah, um, I, I would, I mean, not to question the work, but, but I would say that for long-term optim optimization, I would not rely on monoculture patches. Um, all it takes is like one wave of powder mildew, and, and there you go. That and uh, one of the reasons for all the mixes, uh, I, I and our guys, uh, you kind of create honey corridors for predators, and one of the reasons for the multiple mixes is, is to give more protection to. No, not just the pollinators, but the other insects in the, in the mix. I don't know the generic name for Roundup, or I would use it. Is Roundup acceptable to use or not acceptable to use? I've heard both, but I don't know which one to accept. <laughs> you mean in your home garden or in your home garden? garden. Right. Home garden. Yeah, I, I, I think it's like, you know, Roundup, you know, it's a, it's a non-selective herbicide. You know, it's like any pesticide. If you're going to use it, have a good reason. Like just what you guys were talking about. May was talking about, have a good reason for using it. Are there other things that you can do to take care of that weed? Uh, is it, it's not something you're going to be spraying on typically on, uh, I shouldn't say on flowering plants, but you probably wouldn't be if it's in a flowering stage. You're probably because at that point, once it's at the flowering stage, you probably already lost the game anyway, because uh, you should have been spraying it when it was much younger before it flowered. Uh, so I would say that's probably part of it too. Uh, so I think it's like any pesticide; it has to be used properly, and just overall reduction of any pesticide, I think, is probably a good route to go and think of other things. But I can guarantee you, uh, the quack grass. In my garden, um, if it raises its little head in the springtime, I guarantee it, it gets a little roundup, a little glyphosate on it, and that takes care of it. Uh, I have tons of pollinators, I have frogs, I have everything else. So, you know, I think it's how it's used, when it's used, and why it's used. I was going to add on that. Um, I actually like using roundup in some situations too, like she's saying. Um, I don't really mean this whole thing. Uh, so like if I'm working on a CRP project that's been sitting out there idle for 20 years and has never had any management done to it, it's just a straight stand of brown grass or switchgrass with zero diversity. And a lot of times the only way to fix that is just to completely start over. And to completely start over you're looking at chemical application and just scorching it with Roundup and starting over. It's, it, you're going to have a year where it's nothing to make it, you know, 20 years of something. There have been discussions about the homeowner and also the farmer, but has there been any serious consideration how the uh, highway right-of-ways could be used as a yeah. source for pollinators? Um, on April 30th, uh, the White House Executive Office convened a meeting of about 50 invited individuals for representing all kinds of uh, corporations, nonprofits, universities. Um, for an initiative on pollinator health. And two months later, there was a, a presidential memorandum, essentially an executive order, which charged all the federal agencies uh, to do everything they can to improve pollinator health and pollinator 
uh, habitat. And among the charges was to use the, and I'm trying to remember, it was 17 million acres of federally owned highway right of way as a, a way to diversify the landscape. So this is this was a subject, of, I was at that meeting, a subject of considerable discussion. You talk about lawns of the ways. I, I mean, who, why are you mowing these? Why do you it pollutes the environment, you know, it's labor cost, it reduces diversity. I can see if the wheat, well, usually the corn is taller than everything else, <laughs> yeah. but, but it's an incredible opportunity. There are millions and millions of acres that um, could be productively planted and, and, um, and made, or just uh, diverse natural habit, uh, communities. And uh, yeah, so that that's on, that's on the, the list. I don't know, wasn't that done? I know at least when you're coming down on 72, there are some, eight, you know, there's some land along there, and I know uh, around Springfield, and, I, and I'm not so sure. Illinois passed in law, Goyevich, um, one of his first laws that got passed. They're only supposed to be mowing two swaths along the interstate and the center. But I will tell you, I, I've worked fields, walked fields along the interstate, it's going to be a great place for plants, but I don't look for wildlife to ever. You go stand by an interstate and you'll quickly <laughs> see. It will take you only about 30 seconds to realize why you don't see wildlife taking advantage of that. <laughs> but it'll be a great place for us to have a huge amount of biodiversity of plant life that we can move elsewhere eventually. So. Actually, butterfly rope kills pretty common. <laughs> okay, another question. Um, with solitary bees and, and flies stem nesting plants, I'm concerned, I have in my backyard both a small prairie patch as well as a, a pretty good sized stand of uh, cultivar decorative grasses. I leave those all winter, uh, just for the seeds, for whatever, for whoever drops by. But my concern is that I burn both of those every spring uh, to try to you know keep everything else under control. But now I'm concerned about the solitary bees that may be nesting in those those grasses. And you know, is there a point at which I can burn and, and figure that they've already moved on? That, that's a problem here in central Illinois. I mean, burning is the optimal way to manage, but his, because historically the the tall grass prairie is a so-called fire adapted uh, climax yeah, community, climax. so the plants depend on and to be maintained routine burning. Um, and uh, wherever there is no burning, that's where trees uh, and shrubs take, uh, move in. Now that's fine when you had, you know, miles and miles and acres and acres of undeveloped land. The problem is that postage stamps now. So uh, historically, fires were patchy, and there were places that wildlife could, and by which I also mean insects, um, could disperse. So that that is a problem. Uh, Prairies that are managed for flowers, for plants, often end up uh, not helping the resident insects because they have no place to go. There are little tiny moths, they're called Microlepidoptera, and a lot of them are internal feeders of a lot of, of prairie plants. And when you burn a prairie, there's no adjacent prairie for them to disperse to. But if you know that there are other patches nearby, then um, the, the likelihood, I can't really make management recommendations, but you, you can sleep at night at least, knowing there's a chance. <laughs> How long should be your mind? Oh, really? Some of the species, tiny moths don't fly very far. But, uh, uh, wait, I think someone species. asked, How often should you burn? How often should we burn? If we've got a pack like that, how often? You, every um, year, uh, two years, five years? Our biologists recommend once every three years. And actually, if you come to our office, we recommend you only do a third of it every yeah, year. Yeah, so, like you were saying, you. You're not burning off all the habitat in one shot. And there's also been uh, even more recent research done showing that maybe even once every five to six years is more optimal than once every three years, just to kind of let that succession happen. But obviously not every year or every year. Yep, you don't want to burn every year. That's too much or too little succession. And then also, uh, a lot of times, to help what she's talking about, we'll promote fall burns. Um, and that really helps the wildflowers in a stand to keep rejuvenated every year. If you want. If you want a success on the burning, uh, the Barnhart Prairie south of Urbana, um, we've got 100 acres there, it's preserved. We now have finally gotten, turned the corner on this prairie. We're now control 
We burn it every spring. Uh, we've actually instigated a fall burn, but it has helped us tremendously. But just like he's saying, we only burn a section and we have maps and we try and spread it around. And I, I do believe they're actually trying to stretch it out to five years now. But it's a huge help in your flowering plants. I have a question about the uh, CRP uh, plots that are put back to native growth. That, they look beautiful, but I wonder, since they're so close to crops, if the pesticides aren't still a problem for pollinators. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, well, I don't know any talk about really practical. Um, it depends on the pesticide. Now, um, the and also, gosh, the soil type and drainage. Um, the seed dressings, the seed coatings, were actually developed to be environmentally compatible. It, it's ironic. Everything we do that we do to you know, protect the environment turns out to have unintended consequences. So, um, you treat the seeds in order uh, to avoid having to apply, you know, uh, broadcast pesticides or flyovers with airplanes. The problem is <coughs> pesticides don't stay put either. Um, there was a problem early on with uh, corn dust. Um, an in inappropriate sticking agent was used and um, all the pesticide that was supposed to be on the seed was flying in the air and, and killing, and there was bycatch of, of bees. But even when, it, when it's, in, it's picked up systemically, uh, some of the neonics have a very long uh, residual time in the soil. Not all of them. So again, it depends on the pesticide. Some of them will remain in the soil and depending on the patterns of water movement, it can affect neighboring properties. But in, in general, I, I would, you know, oh, hey, here in central Illinois, so much of it is, is <laughs> corn and soybeans, and now seed-treated corn and soybeans. I would think that, in general, that, that neighboring uh, native vegetation would be a, a much preferred. And if, if there is contamination, it would be much lower levels. I'm going to give a little advertisement before the next question. Um, on our website, the one that Sandy referenced, we've listed all the different organizations that have native plant sales, Grand Prairie Friends, the Soil and Water Conservation Districts, the Master Naturalists. So look for that um, if you're having trouble finding native plants. Just would you stop having them on the day of the spring bird count? <laughs> Contact me ahead, I'll get them for you. Given, given the amount of corn that's planted in this, in this area, um, one of the speakers generated some concern about bees, specifically bees, feeding on corn dust or corn roots. Uh, I can see two, two concerns there. One is with uh, seed that might be coated with, with insecticides, but of course the other is Bt corn. And so the question is, um, Bt corn, is there evidence that it is toxic to bees? Right in the early days of CCD, that was what everybody glommed onto, and there is an abundance of literature that provides absolutely no evidence of non-target impacts of Bt corn pollen. Uh, the reason is that the Bacillus thuringiensis of the Bt is it's a, a, bac a bacterium which produces an endotoxic <coughs> protein. There are many, many different no. strains or varieties of Bacillus thuringiensis, and each curiously seems to be specifically targeted to particular orders of insects. Uh, and what goes into Bt corn is uh, historically has been BTK, the Silsterogensis perstachii, which is targeted for lepidopterans. BT corn was developed to control European corn borer and other uh, pests of, of corn, you know, beavers. And it just doesn't affect bees. What it, the effect it would have on bees is if they're eating corn pollen instead of something healthier. Uh, but that's true for just about any corn pollen. We had beehives for about 20 years, from 1964 into the 80s. We had 10 to 12 hives most of the time. We had very little die-off. We had a dairy farm. We had alfalfa. We did a lot of organic <laughs> fertilizers. And until then, later, they did start using the, the chemicals on the sprays and so forth. But eventually, we did quit because they had um, some 
diseases that bees naturally get in. We also, because they had so much work making hay, we did quit because we didn't have enough labor. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? I just, uh, I just want to add today's corn, Pinty corn, is, uh, is actually corn rootworm uh, resistant, and that's uh, uh, BTT. It's a different form of the endotoxin, and it specifically affects coleopterans or beetles. So again, there is no BT that has a, a toxic protein that, that affects, this, that at least is used in genetic modification of, of crops uh, that targets hymenopterans, and I don't know why they would ever be. <laughs> so just a side note on the whole BT corn. Uh, I have more farmers coming in trying to find the non-BT varieties out there because they find they yield better. So not, not every acre you see out there is getting planted to the to this triple stack and the other names you hear out there. Uh, this kind of goes along with what Sandy was talking about. Uh, Doug Ptolemy is going to be at the uh, Midwest Urban Garden Show. Uh, he's the keynote speaker who is the author of the book, The Living Landscape, and he will be there uh, February 13th and February 14th at um, Times Square Mall in Mount Vernon. I think it's Friday evening and I think Saturday morning, late morning. You have to check those times. But he'll be doing a keynote speaking there and it's free, open to anyone who shows up. He's, a, he's an excellent He's actually, he's an excellent, he's an excellent speaker and has beautiful photographs and really, really talks from the heart because he talks about a lot of things that as he's looking at his own landscape, and it's really great, besides being a very knowledgeable person. Any other questions? For Sandy Mason, I was looking at your uh, slides in your uh, presentation and it was talking about when you were talking about having water available for uh, I believe the the bees I get, don't remember exactly what it was for but for pollinators it had there was one slide that said that to have a wet place with sea salt on it and I that got my attention I was curious about that yeah, and actually maybe Nate can talk about this uh, more knowledgeable than I am. Uh, but uh, butterflies, especially the males, when they first come out, they, they like to do something called puddling. And I don't know if you've ever seen them in there. Often you'll see them on the road, especially on country roads and stuff, and they're really picking up minerals. Um, the dissolved minerals, and so, am I correct on this? Uh, the dissolved min minerals, so basically you're sort of mimicking that thing for the, and it's actually, it's a fun thing to watch anyway when they all get together, and they're all, they're all fresh uh, right out, and they look all beautiful. Hi, a question for Jason. Uh, we have a small field with clover and uh, alfalfa in there, and we're thinking about putting pheasants in there, but we harvest it for hay. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, about introducing pheasants or about what kind of mix you want to have? Um, actually, uh, through Pheasants Forever, we don't really promote introducing pheasants at all. Um, we're more about promoting habitat because we've actually found that when you promote pheasants to an area, you're actually putting out a dinner plate for the, all the predators there because they're not near as smart as wild birds. So you're basically you know, bringing in all the coyotes and foxes and raccoons into an area, and in, in the long run, you actually hurt yourself. Okay, one more question, and then I'm going to let it go. One of the problems with an alfalfa field is you're going to want to harvest it right in pheasant's nesting season. And now, anybody, a lot of you are probably old enough and done it, but when you go out with a sickle mower and cut the hay, those hens won't get off that nest, and pretty soon you've got a hen in your sickle. To add to that too, when you guys are cutting off alpha, it's best to start in the middle and then kind of just make squares to the outside. Because when you start on the outside and you work your way in, you're actually moving all the birds to the inside and kill them more that way. So when you start in the middle, you're at least giving them a chance to get out of there. This is for uh, Jason. Uh, I've got like two acres of prairie grass that I burned at probably 10 years old. Uh, 15 different dwarf grasses. Honey bees right in the middle of it. He said I could put new seed into it. Do yeah. I have to burn it and then drill it, or can yeah. I burn it and then broadcast it? Um, the best way to do it is to do to do a fall burn and then drill it in the fall or drill it in the spring. But uh, a lot of times it's easier to broadcast it, like you're saying. So what we'll do is uh, have the other guys go out in the middle of the winter right after it snow 
and you can either just you know do it by hand with a broadcaster, or you can have if it's bigger acreage have a co-op come do it with an airflow seeder. But yeah, the best is to do it right after a snow because then the seed just sits on top of that snow, and when it melts. It melts the seed right into the dirt, just like it would nat naturally. So, will I get the same amount of uh, germination with broadcasting as I will with Um, Typically, yes. A lot of times with broadcasting, depending on the soil type or the area, we'll recommend twice as much seed, or at least 50% more seed. But yeah, yep, you will. I think the thing you can vouch for is one of the things about all these prairie plants and grass seeds is they don't need to be in the soil. I've got farmers that come in and didn't get anything to grow, and then I find out they're putting an inch and a half in the ground. It doesn't work. They barely, as a matter of fact, a lot of my best plantings have been, like Jason said, a broadcast, and then we, have, we just roll with the lawn roll. Did you burn it first? Or just send this out Oh, I follow Jason on that one, to be honest. I just, I, the farmers that have just taken a field right out of production, they've already harvested. Those are the guys that I've told, don't touch it, just broadcast it. Get a lawn roller, or a lot of those guys have what they call the clod busters back in the 80s. Still sitting in the shed somewhere, it's just a big, thin roller. And roll it, because it just gives that right amount of contact to seed soil ratio. And the, the uh, general rule of thumb with the seed size is, however big the seed is, that's how much you want under the dirt. So, like a lot of grass seeds, maybe a quarter inch long, so that's how deep you want it. Some of the forbs are really tiny. So you just barely want them under the but surface. I can't, I can't do it in the, in the spring or do it in the spring, broadcast it in the spring. Yeah, you can do that too. Um, broadcasting in the spring, I definitely recommend using twice as much seed because of all the rain. It'll just get runoff and it'll kind of um, cause the seed to run off into the low spots. We, we do plant until about June 15th. We okay that at the office generally.